I, I, I don't want to break this like too, too bad to like, you know, freak you out or anything, but uh-huh. uh, you're, you're leading up to Jake with the closing keynote. Oh uh, man. So, so, uh, uh, well, I've been the front man or warm up to. So Jake's on 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 my cool list. I well, I was uh, the opening act for Charlie Miller for a long time as a tra- talking circuit. We did, so that was fun. Oh, no. uh, I mean, that was that was something. Uh, oh. So Jake Jake's uh, on the list as far as like hashtag infosex celebs. Infosex celebs, yeah, that's right. And you can from here on out. You can go uh-huh. up and you can be like, uh, hey, Jake, hey, Jake, you and I were like conference buddies together. So remember that? Remember that cool time? Jake, hey, Jake, it's me. I, I opened for. He's walking. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, go ahead and take it away, sir. OK, hopefully everyone can hear me. This is going to be the quick start guide to MITRE ATT&CK. And when I say quick, we're going to hustle through this thing. It's going to be a lot of fun. This will be. A, uh, a vi- you know, with a quick preface, the slides are going to be shared at the end, so you don't need to screenshot all the things. I will share it, so that's a thing. Um, I'm going to provide sources for all the things that are in the speaker notes of these slides, which, again, I will share at the end. And I will use some memes, because apparently that's the cool thing you have to do. Um, but uh, the- there's text for the memes and the like there uh, in the speaker notes, again, once you have it at the end. So that's all good. So real quick, just who am I? At any given moment, I'm any one of these three people. This was taken at Deadwood. But in reality, I'm this person. So I'm the <laughs> VP of Product Management at Scythe. We do adversary emulation, simulation, synthetic malware, a bunch of fun stuff. It's cool. I also volunteer at the Red Team Village at DEF CON. So I help run their 101 track. And I was a speaker there and volunteer with all sorts of things. And I've got a background in engineering solutions and cryptography and privacy, whatever. That's not what you're here for. What you are here for is if you're curious about MITRE ATT&CK, and I guarantee that, well, I mean, I've been listening, we've all heard about MITRE ATT&CK a lot, just in general, A, but also even today. So everybody's been talking about MITRE ATT&CK. If you ever just want to take a step back and like, okay, what is this thing in its most practical, boiled down way? Well, that's what we're doing today. This is relevant to blue, red, purple, whatever. Everybody should hopefully find this a little useful. And hopefully we're going to reinforce what MITRE ATT&CK is and how it should be used and some very practical advice. I've got some insights from some industry experts. They um, and myself have brought some new analogies and metaphors and we'll have a bunch of further reading and stuff that's gonna be great. It's all in the notes. Okay, so what this is, is again, very, 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 very fast review. I'm going to way oversimplify a lot of things. I'm going to mention a couple tools. I'm going to bring about a bunch of feedback from humans, but it's not going to be 100% comprehensive. And I'm not just going to rehash this thing. So this is the quick start guide to MITRE ATT&CK from MITRE. I'm not just going to boil this down. It's going to be a little more than that. We also have uh, some how-to guides in the industry. This is not what that is. I'm not going to give you a how-to guide on how to run these tools. And it's not, unfortunately, going to give perfect attribution to everyone. Just, I tried. And if you see a Twitter in the bottom corner there, that's, uh, we did okay. And there's a bunch of stuff in the speaker notes, too. Okay, so let's get started. First off, what's the problem? Well, again, you've all heard MITRE ATT&CK uttered many, many, many times, even in the past 24 hours. And the new things are, you know, I, I like Bryson's tweet here. My next presentation will be MITRE ATT&CK review of MITRE ATT&CK using MITRE ATT&CK. Or, you know, the other one here is substantially uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework compliant. Hmm. Tell us about that. The buzzword bingo folks have grabbed MITRE and are shaking it for all of its worth. And so let's boil down again. What is MITRE ATT&CK in its most base way? If you had to explain it to someone in an elevator, MITRE ATT&CK, breaking it in half, MITRE. They're not for profit. They're federally funded. They're an R&D shop. They're an organization that does that. Cool. Again, oversimplification, but that's fine for our purposes here. ATT&CK. It's a grid of threat actor behaviors, framework of we call you know TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures, and they have IDs. So example, you know, key logging that has a specific ID, just one square in that grid. And for the sake of this conversation, we'll talk about threat actors as adversaries as seen in the cybersecurity industry. So again, MITRE, an organization, created ATT&CK, which is a framework, a grid of ad threat actor IDs. Neat. And there's actually quite a few uh, MITRE ATT&CK matrices or uh, matrices, matrix, matrices, I don't, it doesn't matter. There's multiple of these things. There's the pre-attack and the mobile and the ICS, you don't care. It's the enterprise one you care about, unless you work in you know, the ICS industry or something. 
We're only going to be talking about the Enterprise one for the sake of simplicity. here. Okay, MITRE ATT&CK. Who created this? Again, it was the team, at the attack team at MITRE. They're great. Um, specifically, uh, Blake Strom is kind of seen as the, the point person for that. Uh, wait, hold on. No, that's not Blake. Um, that's Blake. There we go. And there's a group of people who are really, you know, drove the innovation of this forward. They're all great. And again, these are all shared in the slides later. So you'll have them. There's, yeah. And there's Blake. To the do's and don'ts. Again, the quick start guide is what this whole thing's about. And we're already four minutes in. Yikes. Number one, when you're talking about the MITRE ATT&CK language, please use it as a common language. And this, hey, yeah. hey, hey, I'm going to tell you, go ahead and slow down. You have until the top of the hour. We're not going to hold you to 15 minutes. Breathe, because you're about to, our heads explode. Okay? No, see, this is, was going to be a whole lot of fun if I could do the whole thing without taking a breath. So right, now, if you've got to do it twice, that's still okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Cool. I was going to cover the whole thing, but now I can take, slow down a little bit. Do, please do this. Use the MITRE ATT&CK matrix as a common language for everybody. It doesn't matter how technical you are or what executive you're talking to or what team you're on. Absolutely think of it as a way that everybody can understand and speak the same language. This question was just even from yesterday in the Discord. If your security organization or your, your organization is given a pen test, a red team, and they, uh, they're very, you know, you're young in your security maturity. Like, how do you look at this giant attack matrix and do anything with? Well, it's, again, that common language idea. Not every executive inside of a company knows what sticky key vulnerabilities are or the way Windows API keys are used to achieve those things and the like. But everybody understands a big box that says keylogger in it. And whether or not that box turns blue or red or whatever, that's a really nice common language. So you can generate reporting out of that, sure, but just as a way to speak about it. Hey, look, these are a bunch of boxes. These are boxes I'm worried about. Neat, right? It's that kind of idea. And so to kind of slowly start thinking about it, just open up the MITRE ATT&CK matrix page and look at a single box and say, well, let's see what we can do with this one thing today. Now, to that end, don't. Do not make MITRE ATT&CK a checklist or focus on coverage. This is a really dangerous thing to do because, as it turns out, there's lots of ways to achieve these goals at any given moment. So, for you know, example, pulling bash history, right? Well, there's a few ways you could do that and more, even more ways being discovered every day. So don't say, oh, neat, we solved this whole column or we solved these IDs, we are done, they're monitored, off to the races. Don't think of it that way. Again, it's iterative. It's just as a way to frame yourself when you're looking at threat actor behaviors. And so to that end, do seek out behaviors, not signatures. And this one is really critical. And a, a lot of the offense and defensive folks we've heard from today and yesterday have brought this up. So as an example, MITRE ATT&CK has T1124 system time discovery. And one example of how a threat actor pulls for that technique is net time hosting. Cool, but don't just log and signature for that and say T1124, solved. That's not the right way to think about it because if a given APT uses that in V1, well, that's all good. But if all of a sudden V2 of their malware comes out and they're using PowerShell get dates, you now have a, that kind of broken signature. And so again, it's about the threat actor behaviors and putting yourselves in that mindset, both as an adversary and as a defender. Another one, and, and Bryson actually just spoke to this even yesterday, Think a periodic table for adversaries. It's a chemical mixture. Adversaries are made up of context, order, and state, and the techniques they use. But even though they might be a collection of given techniques at any given moment, those things individually are just inert objects. Noticing of a handful of given techniques, don't just assume, oh, this must be that threat actor. It's an indicator. It's a generalization. So we need to think about it that way. So to that end, we should use these examples as a foundation. One example uh, of a way to do that is using tools. If you want to test for adversarial behavior, Caldera by MITRE. It's a great open source project. It creates agents. It fires operations. It's all excellent, right, as far as using it goes. Even though the goal might be to make your validation of given techniques trivial, right, to look for specific behaviors and to run them in a certain order and the like there, and even though we get the ability to use these command playbooks as a baseline for our defenses and look for those kinds of specific techniques and commands, you can't lock yourself into, oh, well, I deployed this threat actor in this tool, and therefore I now have an understanding of that threat actor. Because 
we can't assume that these TTPs always equal those threat actors. Threats are nuanced. We all know that. And they're really tricky to replicate with tooling, whether it's custom made or one out of the box. And so falling into that false sense of security can be particularly dangerous. The idea, again, hearkening back to this common language, MITRE ATT&CK is about a bunch of concepts and generalized techniques almost philosophically. And so you have to decouple the concepts with their implementation. This one uh, from Jeff McJunkin earlier, as well as uh, in Deadwood, the game of Minesweeper. I love this analogy. From the attacker perspective, they're not entirely sure which techniques you might be monitoring for, or even which kind of way to think about those things or which commands you're monitoring for as a, as a defender. And so when you're thinking at a, at a, uh, from an attacker perspective, the grid is this game of Minesweeper, which can be a very challenging experience and a lot of fun. And as a defender, you can think the same way. Oh, well, here's this entire matrix of adversary behaviors. Which of these columns do I care most about? Which of these things are in my threat model and are not? Because your threat model might be wildly different from one that we've heard about today, as an example. And again, this is especially true for people in the ICS world. Their threat models are wildly different from someone who runs, say, a security team. And I, keeping that in mind and playing your own game of Minesweeper is really a good idea. And I love this analogy, so thanks for that. A quick aside, an anecdote. There is a, a team I, I talked to that you have a big wheel of TTPs. And so this is a really exciting way for, if you're running an engagement as an example, to go ahead and just stick a bunch of things on that and spin the wheel and say, okay, we're gonna do this technique today. So anyway, you can always challenge yourself and think about it that way. But apparently these wheels are really expensive on Amazon. Anyway, the next thing that I do not recommend you do is copy, paste, enter. Now, I'm going to preface the upcoming slide with the statement of, here's some things that I really love and I think that are amazing. I think Red Canary is an amazing team. I think Atomic Red Team is an awesome open source framework. And again, you all can look into this later. There's notes in the slides. I think practical examples of adversary behavior is super important. However, I have no idea how this sort of thing became okay, right? At what point in time it's like, well, you know what? I want to replicate some adversary behavior. I'm just going to copy and paste this PowerShell command that pulls something off of Bitly and invoke it. That seems like a really neat idea. What? Like, so just please tread carefully while you're testing out this stuff, because again, you're testing out adversarial behavior. You should probably have a good understanding of what these commands do, what kind of payloads you're detonating. And just tread carefully, because again, you all might want to be testing for real adversarian behavior in a real environment to validate that your real defenses are working. And so then copying and pasting something off of GitHub might not be the best idea. And it's kind of odd that we have, as an industry, have said, you know what, copying and pasting this, that's okay. Not those things, that's probably okay. So just, again, tread carefully. And one thing to remember is that you're trying one technique. Again, in the, in the kinds of examples you might find online, adversaries are always changing and the attack matrix is always changing. You always have to go back and look at the updates. There's all sorts of new things happening. And detection can often rely on specific procedures and then sometimes they span multiple procedures and sometimes they span a whole technique. Remembering that this is a Rubik's cube of examples gets you to think about it philosophically as an adversary might and the kinds of techniques again that they're using not specific commands but techniques is important because they're constantly shifting and we we all know that because we just watch the news okay and this is another big one you all have standards that you have in your wheelhouse right you all have different sorts of things and you might be trying new things out and you might be i don't know a NIST five functions or cyber defense matrix just because MITRE ATT&CK is very cool, just because a lot of us are talking about it, just because a lot of vendors are talking about it, and it seems like a really neat thing to do, does not mean it should be your top priority. It's very, very tempting to go with this thing that is very trendy. The temptation is to just put all your chips down on that. I would hesitate and think, what are your priorities? What are the systems that you have to use? What are the kinds of standards that you have to abide by? And having a clear understanding of that will be helpful, right? whether or not MITRE ATT&CK can fit into that or not. All these models are not intended to be bingo cards where you check the box and you're off to the races. So to summarize, again, we went very fast through that. Not as fast as I was going initially because, you know, we're allowed to breathe, apparently. But uh, attack 
is a framework that can be used as a common language across an entire organization on any part of the org chart, hopefully. And it's meant to be a baseline of behaviors, not specific commands. And one thing that I think is important to point out is the MITRE ATT&CK matrix, regardless of your, if you're using tools that align to it, or you know, you're using Atomic Red Team, or you're blogging about this, or you're a network defender aligning to it, or you're doing offense aligning to it, it's a great opportunity to get involved because this is something that's growing, has a growing importance to all of us because of that ability for it to be a common language. And so really, if you find any sort of way to blog, or tweet, or whatever, and, and help move the industry forward by aligning with this and talking about it and how you're all using it, it can be incredibly valuable. Use it as another way to get involved, regardless of whether it's with the project itself or much of the tooling using it or so on and so forth. So that's pretty much that. Although a lot of what I just said probably won't matter soon because they're rolling out this thing called sub techniques and it's just going to be a mess. So, I mean, that, that'll be fun. We'll, and we could probably redux this entire conversation later after those are rolled out and what they mean for all the tooling that uses it. So uh, with that said, apparently we get to go much longer now, I guess, if there's more questions, if we have time, we probably don't. And I guess finally, I think if, yeah. I, I've got a question for you. A lot of the stuff that is coming out is tying to the MITRE ATT&CK technique matrix, and it seems like the vast majority of it is basically the company puts up the MITRE ATT&CK technique matrix outside of their booth at RSA, and they say, look, we detect stuff, and they don't really say what they detect. My favorite example is vulnerability scanners. Honestly, if you're doing just a straight external vulnerability assessment scan, it, it detects like two of the possible initial attack and compromise techniques and it ignores everything else, but they still have the uh, banners up there. And then further, the detection with standard traditional event logs really doesn't work unless you start getting into like full sysmon or EDR. So as far as maturity, where do you think we are right now as an industry for actually changing the way that we look with attack mapping and threat modeling and all of that? That is a great question. I think we're still kind of figuring it out. It speaks a lot to how much the framework has really been able to gain traction in the past year or so, really. And the fact that all these vendors are gluing themselves to it as it's a, as it's a good idea. And the nice thing is, is that, yes, right now there's a bunch of scanners that say, we align the MITRE attack and they're like, tick, tick. And there's two things, or maybe like, hey, we grepped for all the your logs that you had CMD and therefore look at all the IDs you found. Although that's kind of the wrong way to look at, at it, it's still better that we're dipping our toe into the water in MITRE attack in those ways and kind of the, the, even the product perspective. And they're more, it's more meaningful than saying, oh, this is machine learning blockchain silliness, right? It's MITRE attack is a good thing to align to, even though there's still a little bit of a hair of snake oil in the industry. If Even if they begin that way, folks that are using their products could say, hey, you said you aligned to MITRE attack, and these are just a couple of the things that were pulled up. Why not these things, right? And that'll help move the product industry forward and, and get the vendors to actually think about it. So there's a long answer to a short question, John. I don't know if that helps. No, uh, that's fine. And I might have uh, might have a question here with you kind of bleeding into Bryson's presentation. With your background, you went over it very, very quickly here. What is the most difficult thing you think right now um, with trying to do full threat simulation and emulation? Yeah, the the real trick of that right now is the idea that we're pretty comfortable with signatures still, especially seen when you're doing adversary emulation in agent-based context, because usually those agents are put on golden master boxes and they repeat known PCAPs and do that whole show, which is good. Like we should be validating our defenses in that way. We should be making sure the firewalls are firewalling and we should be making sure network monitors are, are monitoring. But it kind of takes us out of the real world a little bit when we're not actually detonating even benign adversary behavior on a production payload and doing weird exfiltration events on production machines because we, we do need to move beyond the signature-based dependency that we've been sitting in for so long and start to think, well, what is the threat actor actually doing? And how do I move beyond, I can catch any one a cry, or the base, as long as it's version one, because I know it's signature, to actually, how do I catch anything that does encryption in a rogue way? And so moving beyond these standard signatures and templates and things we've got into a real live fire environment and saying, hey, 
I'm going to make some custom malware today, and it's going to create a directory and create a bunch of files, encrypt those files, delete the originals, and then exfiltrate the thing and download a ransom note. If I would notice that behavior, even if it wasn't tied to a real threat actor, that would be very, very cool. If you had to take a guess, just a wild guess, and we'll use MITRE as the baseline because everyone knows that, with all the problems of being locked into just that framework, how much do of the existing pen test methodology do you think can or should be automated? Kind of like vulnerability assessments. Years ago, we had to download tons of scripts and we had to test them one at a time and we had to do banner grabbing and lookups. And then yeah. Satan and Sarah came and made that a lot simpler for us. And everyone was like, well, that's the end of red teaming and pen testing because we have this automatic thing called Nessus now. And it didn't really replace it. But it, it basically pushed the, the state of the art for pen testing a little bit further out. And that was a good thing. So if we were going to say, OK, the amount of work that a traditional red team or a pen tester does, what percentage of that kind of grunt work do you think could be done today with automation frameworks? You know, not picking on any one automation yeah. framework or anything, but if somebody was going to set out to automate it, how much do you think they could actually automate it today? The majority. Uh, and really what it boils down to is essentially the vast majority of adversary behavior is all pretty well known. We know what they want to do on a box and we know how they phone home, generally speaking. And the thing where an operator should take over is lateral move, generally speaking. And, there, and that one I call out really specifically because lateral movement can be very tricky. Right? You have to do credentialing things and you have to look in documents and you have to make some assumptions. More importantly, the moment you're automatically laterally moving, you open the door to like becoming an auto-hacking tool. And auto-hacking tools are inherently dangerous, right? And no one wants to open the door to the risk of accidentally knocking over a domain control, which that pl is plausible when you have automated lateral movement. So that's kind of where, in my experience, I think people kind of not only do, but need to draw the line, both practically and from an automation perspective. Because you want to test real scenarios without dramatically increasing the risk to your organization by using automation. You're trying to make your life easier, not harder, because you knocked over your domain controller as a muscle. So yeah. hopefully that helps. And the, kind of the other thing about that is, is, I think automating an entire pen test is bad. But man, if they could just automate the same crap that we do every single time, I think that would be fantastic. Flynn Geek has a question. Uh, our GRC team has been very focused with uh, CIS controls. It's been fun and challenging to take on attack alignment. By the way, I do have a spreadsheet, Flynn Geek. Maybe I should just release it. But if you want to shoot me an email, John at BlackHillsInfoSec.com, I have a spreadsheet where I went through and I mapped as many of the attack controls as I could in one airplane ride from D.C. to Denver in one sitting to the Center for Internet Security Controls. So if you want that, shoot me an email and I will get that to you. Maybe I'll just load it up somewhere as well and seeing if it actually works. So Jorge talked about and said our team focuses on automating all the stuff that we continually do a repeatable and then they can move on and use their brain for new procedures, which mm -hmm. is great. But, 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 but I'm trying to see. Rusty Skills asked, how do we change minds at the next level of InfoSec? Red teaming is great, but it seems not to be Complete, able to completely change minds on its own? Ooh, good question. Take yes. It. Yes. Okay. That one, there's a cheat code for that. And we kind of, as an industry, we kind of accidentally our way into it. And as someone who does products in this industry, I, I, when I figured this out, or when we kind of collectively figured this out, something really cool happened. The cheat code for this is thinking about budgets, right? Okay. So the red team budget is actually this much, and it's actually part of the security team's budget, which is actually part of the IT staff's budget, which is part of, like, if you think of it that way, it's like, well, they actually get kind of the tiniest sliver. And so how do you expand the importance of the work the red team is doing? You do that by introducing the blue team and the IT staff. And the way we do that is by purple teaming. And so, again, like, purple teaming was, became the new big cool thing. It's collaborative, and it's a really good exercise and all that sort of stuff. It's kind of tricky to do if you don't have a red team, for example. But the idea of expanding adversary emulation and expanding things like understanding threat actors and the like to not only just the red team, but the entirety of the IT staff, you've secretly expanded to the entirety of the IT budget. And when the IT budget says, we need to focus on threat actors, executive leadership notices because you're talking about real impact to a real organization and showing that collaboratively with you know a blue and red you achieve those goals so 
talk, thinking about Purple Team as a way to kind of hack your way into bigger budgets and hack your way into more importance and to get executive leadership to think about it is very cool. Either that or you just print out a grid with all the threats you're vulnerable to and show them a bunch of red squares. I guess that could work. Um, it's just a mechanism. It's not necessarily think, what I would do, but it's a way that works sometimes. But I think it can work if you're yeah. using it from the perspective of a gap analysis, saying yeah. these are the specific areas that we're missing, and here's the specific technical controls we can put in place. But you, you talk about the blue side, and there's a lot of times I feel like we're running around trying to put our fingers in the dam where yeah. we could just unilaterally be better at blocking PowerShell and command execution by standard users or enabling host-based firewalls so workstations can't talk to each other. There's yeah. a lot of things we could do, but I think that it only comes from that collaboration. And then the only way that we get there is with results and seeing how we can actually make things better rather than yeah. red teams, which tend to have a tendency in most companies to show how they can make things worse. And that doesn't seem to help us all. Yeah, so the only gotcha on the whole showing the big re all the red squares to executives is if you then roll out a bunch of new defensive stuff and the squares stay red for like <laughs> ever, You've, you've introduced danger into your decision making for the future. But again, yeah, I, John, I think that's excellent advice. Yep. And you touched on it in your talk. I think the biggest mistake that can be made is whenever you start writing signatures that are too tightly coupled to an example in MITRE. I, I look at the Sigma stuff and I love the Sigma project. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Problem with Sigma is some of their signatures are like, Look for a process that executes with the name Mimikatz. It's like, oh, dear God, no, that's not, that's not what we're talking about, making things better. Exactly. And, and that's where you're just like, well, I'm just going to rename it Mimidogs. See what happens. Yeah, it's way yep. too effective. <laughs> the advanced set attack as well.